Nature and traditional agriculture could feed our ancestors, but today there are seven and a half billion people on the planet. Our urbanized society needs new technologies. In this special edition of Futurist, we investigate how scientists are helping farmers and industrialists across Europe. Alexandros Gasirius manages 700 hives at his apiary in central Greece. Each hive needs to be regularly checked for indicators of the bee's well-being. The mathematician turned beekeeper helped to develop a smartphone app that simplifies these inspections. This mobile app gives us, the beekeepers, two digital assistants. One accompanies us when we work in the field, and the other is useful back home where you can access it through the web. The voice-operated app B-Notes asks a set of questions about each hive. The beekeeper replies using a hands-free system and the answers are automatically filed into a cloud database. If I were just using a voice recorder, I would need to listen to eight hours of recordings every day after I returned home. This is not necessary anymore. With this app, you don't spend much time or any at all playing back your recordings. Developed with support from a European research project, the app's interface helps the beekeeper to analyze the data and efficiently manage the apiary, for example, in disease prevention or in the selection of bee colonies for reproduction. The point is that it allows the beekeeper to choose the best honeybees with the best queens in order to reproduce them year after year. So, step by step, the total number and the quality of bees improve. The software, still in development, currently works in several languages. As well as in this small village in Greece, it's being used by hundreds of beekeepers in Europe, the Americas, Africa and Australia. A true gathering of statistics and minds to allow both developers and end-users to improve their operations. It's the first time that beekeepers are able to collect data on such a large scale. Bringing these beekeepers together really helps us to develop the technical intelligence that we need in order for apiculture to open up a new chapter to move forward in the future. Smoked meat and sausages may be delicious, but they are not fit for every diet. Can processed food become healthier while preserving its appetizing taste? This factory in Catalonia is Spain's oldest producer of traditional meat products, such as serrano ham, salami and chorizo, but it's open to innovation. It joined another European research project to develop low-fat and low-salt alternatives to its products. To manufacture both the traditional and low-fat chorizo, we use the same type of pork meat of the highest quality. The essential difference in the low-fat recipe is it only contains 3% fat. Traditional chorizo can contain around 30% fat, which gives it its distinctive taste and texture. In the new healthier recipe, the animal fat is replaced with a specially developed sunflower oil emulsion. 
One of the main objectives of the project was to obtain the traditional taste of chorizo. So we had to make more than 70 different tests to achieve the final result. The company says its new chorizo, with 60% lower fat and 40% lower salt, has been well received by people looking for healthier food options. Apparently, it tastes rather similar to the traditional one. But to be more certain of such claims, can taste actually be measured? That's the goal of the scientists at the French National Institute for Agricultural Research in Dijon. Tests like this one study consumers' perception of reformulated products developed by food manufacturers in various countries. We worked on cheeses, meats, cakes and sauces. And the challenge has been difficult because, in general, some ingredients are multifunctional in food. For example, the salt will not only act on the salty flavour, it will also affect the aromas released and it will affect the texture of the product and the shelf life. Changing the recipe alters the complex chemistry of food flavour. A special instrument measures individual aroma compounds which are released while the test subject chews a food sample. The effect of new production processes on food flavor is then accurately recorded. The process will influence the proportion of certain molecules in relation to others. So maybe these flavors, how they will be released, will be perceived differently. It's at this moment that we need the self-gratification information from the food taster's perception. This product is salty and there's also a little note of fat in the aftertaste. There you have it, it's not bad. Eat local is a popular slogan for those who take pride in their own health as well as the welfare of farmers and the environment. Is it possible to grow food in the heart of a city? In Rotterdam, sociologists are examining a good example of this exact approach. Coffee machines in a typical office building can produce a ton of coffee grounds each month. This waste has more than 99% of the original compounds of roasted beans and contains valuable nutrients. A local startup recognized this as a precious resource and now collects coffee waste from around the city to reuse it. You can do lots of uh, things with it. So you can uh, throw it in your garden for more uh, nutrition for your plants. And we grow food out of it. And uh, normally in Rotterdam, uh, coffee waste uh, is uh, just normal waste. Um, and it goes into the incinerator. The grounds are turned into a substance from which mushrooms are grown. This example of urban farming is one of the subjects of a European sociological study looking for sustainable ways to generate food provisions closer to urban dwellers. The people are alienated from uh, the way the food is uh, produced. Therefore, they don't want to pay for it. They don't know what is uh, healthy for them. And all these problems are related to this separation. And with urban agriculture, we try to integrate uh, food production and food consumption again. And then hopefully the problems of the traditional food system are also going to be solved. Every month, a team of seven produces 400 kilograms of oyster mushrooms for local restaurants. They also organize training courses for new mushroom growers. It's a business strategy that fully relies on the advantages of urban supply and demand. When you compare it to a, a typical, normal dinner, um, the products went uh, about 10,000 kilometers around the world to end up on your plate. And by producing it in the city, we can reduce that to maybe 10 kilometers.
you really have to think about what the city needs and try to adapt to that. And we developed several strategies how you can really distinguish yourself from the conventional food chain, how you can really, how you can really make a difference to the city. And that's the way to go forward, I think. Another subject of the same study is the Kalnitsima Street Quarter in Riga. A unique ensemble of 19th century wooden buildings, it's a creative hub that blossomed around the desire to preserve the local food stalls. This is the only place in Riga where you actually can see that a market has managed to sustain itself and function for several years. So from a research perspective, that's really interesting. Why? Why others fail while this market actually is doing so great? In Latvia, as in many countries, farmers' markets are disappearing, unable to compete with supermarket chains. In contrast, Kalnitsima is thriving, attracting 100,000 visitors per year, a large number for Riga. What's the secret? It's about experience, I would say. That's, of course, that is a uh, modern trend. You, you try, try to create the experience, and in fact, you can't create it yourself. It can be only co-created. People here are um, active participants of, of what this place is. Sociologists found that free cultural events, art exhibits, concerts, and film viewings, and even activities for children, help to unite the community around the shared values of safeguarding cultural heritage and healthy and sustainable living, something that supermarkets can't offer. The enigma of the place and this uh, extraordinary input from culture into uh, food provisioning system in urban environments. So this is amazing how, how much you can propel and accelerate good food coming into the city by the means of culture and I would say also leisure.